I make my own rules, one bonko party at a time. I write history and I read celebrities. I am JMZ. Life is a classroom and I'm here to teach. Welcome back to another episode of Historians on Housewives. You're here with me, Casey. Dr. Jane Mill, the millionaires. And Max. Just Max today? Just Max. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Were you expecting something from we me? We actually were. I'm Max. Still just trying to chase a squirrel with a nut or something. <laughs> I'm rich on Do- Dogecoin now. <laughs> of course you are. So on today's episode, we're going to be talking about acupuncture with Emily Baum. For a little background, I wanted to read us a little bit about the practice of acupuncture from the Real Housewife of Orange County's Dr. Moon's webpage. Um, For context, his website is energymedicinenewportbeach.com. So according to Dr. Moon... Shannon Medores, acupuncturist and energy healer. Acupuncture is essentially a method of healing through the system of meridians that run throughout the body. So Jessica, you want to ask me what a meridian is? I actually wasn't going to, (laughs) but... (laughs) Say, Casey. Say, Casey, tell us, what is a meridian? (laughs) So according to Dr. Moon, meridians are a series of channels that monitor the organs and their functions with energy communications similar to radio waves. Um, I've also heard acupuncturists describe the meridians like highways, like energy highways in your body. So acupuncture points are where acupuncturists insert needles or apply pressure. And so that's like stations that lie along the meridians. Most acupuncture points correspond to a particular organ. And these points have been confirmed by thousands of years worth of doctors and patients, according to Dr. Moon. In reality, the needle does not do any healing itself, but it enables the body to harness its formidable energy effectively so that it can heal itself. Now, I don't know if you just said this, because I didn't hear it, but where have we heard the name Dr. Moon before? Real Housewives of Dallas. Orange County. Orange County. I did. Tiffany Moon. Tiffany Moon isn't on Dallas? Oh, Dr. Tiffany Moon. Oh, not that that, that Dr. Moon. Oh, that's very sharp. Because I've been sitting here going... Am I going to tell them that it's on Dallas? What are, what are they talking about? <laughs> oh, no, there is now two Dr. Moons on Bravo. This is fascinating. Oh this is great. That should be a spinoff show. The two Dr. Moons? Yeah, uh, Moon Squared. Moons and how did we get here? Yeah, and it's like their version of Dr. Drew or like some like, oh, like they deal with like, uh, they take up Dr. Drew's like. Um, In the light of the moon, medical spotlight. With Dr. Moon and Dr. Moon. That's yeah, what I'm that's that. what well, I'm naming like the rehab. show. I was thinking like rehab, like celebrity rehab, but for like Bravo Liberties with Dr. Well, Moon and Dr. Moon. In some ways they kinda already have I guess it's not really a celebrity rehab, but Terry Debro and Paul Nassif have their Hello. own doctor show. They wouldn't even have had that doctor show unless Paul and Adrian were able to leverage it. Because Terry has tried to get into TV before, if you remember. Definitely. And again, like I always like to point out, the brother of Kevin Dubrow from Quiet Riot. (laughs) 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 Quiet Riot. (laughs) No, so we're definitely talking about the Orange County Dr. Moon. But this is a great reminder, Jessica, that there are now two Dr. Moons on Bravo. One way the acupuncture needle works is like an antenna, enhancing the receiving and sending of radio wave-like energy through your body. Another way the needle works is by breaking the cells at the point of insertion, and the broken cells at this acupuncture point attract healing energy and materials. So that's how acupuncture essentially works, according to Shannon Bedore's Dr. Moon. 
And just in case you were wondering, you could go to his website again, energy medicine, newportbeach.com. And there is a tab for not buying. Not a sponsor. Not a sponsor. You can go to the store and see all of the equipment that he sells. This is very controversial with an H on H. I can't get over this. But you can definitely see the supplies that you know Shannon has in her closet. Ooh, intrigue. Well, you got to explain what the supply. You can't just say the supplies and then and then leave that matzo ball hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this isn't awkward at all. It's not awkward at all. If you, you brought rem- it up, you brought it up. You if can't- you remember Shannon's um, colon cleanse where she got the tip stuck and needed David's help, um, <laughs> all of those supplies can be found on Dr. Moon's webpage. I'll just take it out of my... I'll just take an enema. (laughs) Land this plane, Casey. So with that, let me introduce (laughs) Emily Baum. Wait, we can't talk. We can't introduce our our colleague, Emily Baum, falling after. Enemas. Enemas. (laughs) There's got to be a break. So, okay. So, like, if you want to talk about the enemas, like, why... (laughs) <laughs> what makes them controversial? Like you just said that they're controversial, but they're not. They're no controversial one... with us because of how they're packaged. Yeah. No one in H on H is opposed <laughs> to enemas. No, some no one us, at all. Some okay. of us are just more enthusiastic about them. Okay. Than others. The problem with Dr. Moon's store is that he's picturing the supplies with Ziploc bags in the photo. But you would think that you would take a photo of it without the Ziploc bag, especially if you want to sell the family kit gold three rectal tips, latex tube and clamp for $65. Don't put the Ziploc bag in the photo. Oh, that would have been a great game. Figuring out the price of the enema. (laughs) High low. (laughs) High low. Let's do a quick high low on that. Or is this not appropriate? I for already told. I already told you how much it costs. But there's other ones, right? Uh, my question is, what does Casey expect the enemas to become wrapped in? Once you use it, do you then put it in your satin lined bag? <laughs> no, you put it in a plastic bag and you get rid of it. She wants it coming to you like Crown Royal, right, like in those she wants little a Crown Royal bag. Yeah, I don't. I it's fine to actually have it in the Ziploc bag. I just think for that kind of money, you don't take the picture with the Ziploc bag to post on the web page i'm just saying that it doesn't need to come in a crown royal bag because that's a lot of material you just wasted on your own shit (laughs) literally and figuratively (laughs) okay well i should also add that that's not typical acupuncture dr moon has branched out into a lot of different uh healing methods and so uh a little bit more about acupuncture to get us Back on track with Dr. Emily Baum. Um, All acupuncture points are tuned into the whole body's function and are intricately tied to the endocrine and nervous systems. So this is how acupuncture uh, would support healing, according to acupuncturist um, Dr. Moon himself. So with that, let me tell you about Emily Baum. I would also say... Before before we introduce her, and I'll chop part of this up, we should say, like, we're not experts on this at all. Clearly, we don't know what we're talking about. I mean, maybe we don't. Maybe enemas should come in a bit of packaging. <laughs> yeah, we really, I mean, we record these after the fact, the intros, but we really should have asked Dr. Emily Baum about the packaging. Of- well, like I said, it's not traditional acupuncture, right? She's studying the needles and the practice of acupuncture. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moon is just like branching out. And like, this is what I find fascinating is how he's photoing these rectal supplies on his website. I see. Yeah. So, uh, well, we got a lot to learn. So we got to shit or get off the pot. So let's get off. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, bum. (laughs) So, Emily Baum is an associate professor of history at UC Irvine, where she specializes in the history of China and the history of medicine. Her first book, The Invention of Madness, State, Society, and the Insane in Modern China, was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2018. So with that, 
Welcome, Emily Baum. Thank you for having me. Would you be willing to share your housewife's tagline with everybody? Sure. It is, a spoonful of sugar won't help this medicine go down, which I'm not entirely certain what that means, but it seems apropos. I like it. It's like, if you had an attitude, if you had that big personality that was, you know, how should I say? Because there's Emily, and then there's like going to be your alter personality for that. <laughs> for that. I like it. It's my sassy Bravo yes. alternate personality. Yes, that's what it is. We'll, we'll come up with a name for her. I also like it because it's just like a sassy Mary Poppins, but like it also fits with her work. Yes. No, it's perfect branding. Yeah, totally. Perfect branding. Okay, so Emily, we have been colleagues since, uh, you know, you came to UCI. We regularly do coffee or have the occasional social distance drink. And I just recently found out that you were in the Bravo show. I mean, you were so kind to start listening to our podcast, but I never made the connection that you actually might be what we call a Bravo Demic. So we are so excited to have you on the show. Tell us a little bit about how you got into reality TV and Bravo TV in particular. Yeah, well, I actually have no specific recollection about how I got into reality TV. It feels like it's always just been a part of my life. Um, but I guess I really started getting into Bravo and the Real Housewives franchise when I was in graduate school. You know, when you spend all of your time working on these heavy intellectual topics, Real Housewives is just like the perfect way to turn your brain off. It's just so completely removed from anything that's going on in my regular life. Um, but I'll also say just like from a kind of media studies perspective, I also find Real Housewives super fascinating just because you can never completely disentangle which parts are fabricated and which parts are real. I think I remember the time that I really started getting into it was after Russell Armstrong, the estranged husband of Taylor Armstrong died. Mm -hmm. And that was just so shocking to me because, you know, it reminded me that what was going on on screen was actually happening to these people, even if it was confined to this very elite bubble. Can you tell us a little bit about your academic journey and how you came to your current research project? Yeah, so I'm um, trained as a historian of China, but I'm really interested in the history of medicine in China and the history of Chinese medicine. Uh, my first book just came out in 2018, and it's called The Invention of Madness. And it looks at the history of psychiatry and mental illness in, uh, in China in the 20th century. Currently, I'm working on a new project on the history of Chinese medicine in the United States. And specifically, I'm looking at the history of acupuncture and um, the way that acupuncture was sort of reinvented over the last quarter of the 20th century. It was sort of transformed from kind of fringe, highly racialized practice to a practice that eventually became more and more legitimized, more and more integrated into mainstream medicine. So that's what I'm working on now. Can you talk to us a little bit about how and why Chinese medicine became so popular in the U.S.? Yeah, so Chinese medicine has, has been around in the United States for a long time. It's been around since at least the middle of the 19th century, if not earlier. Um, there's actually a, a scholar who just published a book on this. Her name is Tamara Bennett Shelton. Um, and, uh, you know, she talks about how these first Chinese workers started coming to the United States uh, to work on the railway system. And they obviously brought with them their own systems of healing, their own herbal therapies. They set up apothecaries and clinics. Uh, but mainly during this time in, in the 19th century, early 20th century, they were ministering to other Chinese immigrants. Um, they did have some white customers. And a lot of these white customers were people who were looking for alternatives to surgery, right? So rather than undergoing and in basic surgical procedure, they'd often visit a practitioner of Chinese medicine and ask for like an herbal therapy instead. Um, so these practices have existed for a long time, but it really wasn't until around the 1970s that Chinese medicine started to get um, much more popular uh, among mainstream medicine, among the, the mainstream public. And we can trace that to 
I think the year 1972. So it was in 1972 that President Nixon goes to China. Um, this is part of the Cold War. Ever since the Chinese Communist Party had come to power, they had closed Chinese borders to the United States. And so when Nixon goes to China, it's this huge media event. Um, he signaled that he was interested in reestablishing people's people ties. And the Chinese government, as a show of good faith, starts inviting American delegations to China on guided tours. And as part of these guided tours, these delegations would often be brought to hospitals where they would be shown new medical techniques that had apparently been you know, developed or invented since the time that the Chinese Communist Party came to power. Uh, and so then when these American medical delegations came back to the United States, they publicized what they had seen. Uh, they you know, showed a lot of pictures in news magazines. And the American public was just fascinated by things like acupuncture and Chinese medicine. They wanted to know more. And so it was at that point that Chinese medicine really started to take off. So, Emily, in your work, you use this term acupuncture anesthesia. Um can you explain what this term is? Um, how does it work? How did you come across this idea? Yeah, so I had previously talked about these American delegations that were invited to China in the 1970s to tour Chinese hospitals. And one of the procedures that they were introduced to was something called acupuncture anesthesia. Now, acupuncture anesthesia is exactly what the name sounds like. It was acupuncture that was used in place of conventional medicinal anesthetics. Uh, and it would be used often for extremely invasive surgical procedures, things like brain surgery, uh, pulmonary surgery, even C-sections. So a physician would come along to the patient, they'd, they'd put one or two acupuncture needles in a strategic location, and evidently that was uh, sufficient to, to provide enough analgesic that the patient wouldn't require any other medicinal anesthetic. Um, did it actually work? Uh, that is, that's the big question. And it is surprisingly difficult to, to come to a consensus on this. Um, after it, the procedure became more public in the United States, some American physicians began to experiment with acupuncture anesthesia. Uh, and they determined that it worked on some patients and it didn't work on other patients, but they could never really come to a conclusion about why it worked on the patients that it did. Um, some people speculated that maybe there was some physiological effect, like the body releasing endorphins. Um, some people believed that maybe these patients had been hypnotized ahead, ahead of time and they just didn't feel the pain. Um, and then some people just surmised that maybe some patients were um, so adamant about wanting acupuncture anesthesia to work, but they refused to admit that they were experiencing a tremendous amount of pain. So there was no real consensus, um, but ultimately it was, it was determined that acupuncture anesthesia was sufficiently unpredictable as to not be of use in the United States. So it never really took off in the U.S., but for a while in China, for a period of about a decade, it was used for uh, most surgical procedures there, which is kind of incredible. Can I, oh, sorry. I have, no, I have two follow-up questions. No, I'm interrupting you now. Okay. Um, <laughs> is this, um, this sort of sounds like faith healing in the United States, like where evangelical, like certain evangelical preachers will be able to like heal the sick and make people walk again. Is it that type of dynamic that we're, or? or well, that's actually a really, that's a really interesting point because the time at which acupuncture anesthesia was really being used in China was the period known as the Cultural Revolution, which is a, a highly politicized time, a time of a lot of upheaval and political turbulence. And um, one of the things that these American delegations observed when they went to China was that the patients who were undergoing surgical procedures under acupuncture anesthesia would often carry alongside them a copy of Mao's Little Red Book of Quotations, and they would cling to it kind of like a, a communist Bible, right? So there was definitely this element of faith in a higher power. It wasn't um, a godly power. It was a secular power. Uh, but still, a lot of people uh, speculated that perhaps the reason that acupuncture anesthesia seemed to work so well in China, whereas it didn't work that well in the United States, was because there was this additional element of having this experience 
extreme faith in Mao Zedong. Mm. So my two follow-up questions. One, have you tried acupuncture as like part of your research process? All right. So I feel like this is the, the, the question that I always get asked and it's the question that makes me feel like I have no ground to stand on when I talk about history, researching the history of Chinese medicine because no, actually I've never had acupuncture done. And it's not because I am opposed to it. I actually, I'm actually quite interested in, in having it done. I've just never really decided to do it. Um, I, I'm curious, have you guys ever had acupuncture done? So, okay. UCI has an integrative health center and they have... They have acupuncturists, they have like all sorts of like therapies at this integrative health center that it might be harder to like find and put together in like kind of this one-stop shop kind of way. And so I will say that I've been going there for acupuncture and my acupuncturist tells me that the way that it is practiced and works in China is that it's also a meditative process. So the act of the needling is also like when you need to be starting your meditation, right? And like focus on your breathing and, and the, it's as much of a meditative exercise as it is like a kind of energy work, according to my acupuncturist. And um, it's like really weird. I... In the last year, I think I've taken to like a big meditation turn. I actually used like a form of hypnosis meditation when I went into labor to have my baby to where like I actually, it wasn't like painful. I was just kind of alone in the dark breathing. And then all of a sudden like, here comes the baby. It was really interesting. She wasn't literally alone in the dark. I kind of was. (laughs) I mean, I kept closing myself into the bathroom, but there were other people around us. Um, so, so anyway, it was like this really interesting thing when you're talking about this acupuncture anesthesia, where I wonder if the people it worked on were people that had like a deep meditative practice. It's possible. And even the, the Chinese texts that talk about it admit that acupuncture anesthesia did not work on, on everyone. They say that it may be worked on about... 10% of the population, and it tended to be older people. Um, so children, it, w- it wasn't considered to be appropriate for children. Um, but yeah, it's possible that maybe there was some relationship between individuals who were susceptible to acupuncture anesthesia and individuals who were su- susceptible to things like deep meditative practices or people who are able to be hypnotized, these sorts of things. There's no real like scientific consensus about it. There's only a lot of speculation. Yeah. Oh my goodness, this needs to be an H on H field trip for acupuncture. <laughs> sure, why not? In. <laughs> sure, why not? When the world settles down, when the world settles down, we will go. Um, okay, so, but that that is a perfect segue, Casey, because here we live in Orange County. We live in Southern California. What kind of natural... Uh, herbal, non-herbal, non-formally uh, trained doctor, non, I mean, how many earthy, crunchy ways can you get health care in Orange County? Which brings me to the question, so why is, Ch- why is Chinese medicine so popular with wealthier women? Um, and I guess I would ask, did, did Americans reinvent Chinese medicine for consumption and how? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question, and I think there are a couple of ways of answering it. Um, so first of all, there is uh, an anthropologist who coincidentally also works at UC Irvine. Her name is Mei Zhan, and she has studied um, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, or I might just refer to traditional Chinese medicine as TCM in the shorthand from now on, but she studied TCM in the United States. And she makes the argument um, that TCM practitioners kind of rebranded TCM so that it would appeal to people who were suffering from uh, what she refers to as sub-health. So these are people who don't necessarily have diagnosable diseases like cancer, uh, but they still just don't feel optimal. So maybe they're suffering from things like lethargy or chronic pain, or they're depressed. 
And so TCM practitioners kind of glom onto this idea and they start to actively market TCM toward these wealthier individuals who are suffering from a state of sub-health. Um, the other way that I'd answer this question about why uh, TCM and acupuncture tends to attract a wealthier clientele is that I, I also think that it has a lot to do with how our health insurance system works in the United States. You know, a lot of TCM doctors aren't covered by insurance, and so to be able to afford your weekly acupuncture treatments, you have to have enough money so that you can pay out of pocket. So I think there are a lot of things that are that are going on. On the one hand, there is this kind of rebranding and reinvention of TCM, but I also think there are structural issues at play. That's such a good point because the only reason I can go to acupuncture is because of that integrative health center that UCI has because it's covered under insurance. Without it, it's like hundreds of dollars a visit. Right. That's such a great point. So I have... Well, so that point builds on my other point, the fact that, so Emily, you're speaking, and, and I, I swear I do this almost every single podcast, and and I think Casey thanks me because it, it's a good point. So as you're talking, <laughs> I'm thinking of the ways in which you could also be a U.S. historian, and <laughs> I am always looking for someone to tell stories about 19th century U.S. history. So this is a long way of saying it's just, it, it, it's quite incredible when we start talking about branding and just the U.S. in general. Like, you can't be a now history nerd moment. I mean, you really can't be a world historian. Well, you can't be a U.S. historian without knowing the world. Let's just start there. You can't be a U.S. historian. You can probably be another historian, a historian of other regions and, and be able to ignore the U.S. But it's just, it's crazy how the medical practices kind of span, span the globe once it catches on. So, they're hearing these great medical practices and, and Casey's thinking about her acupuncture or meditation. And I'm looking at you going, oh, well, this would be so cool if you took, if you taught the 19th century history class from the perspective of China looking at the U S that's all I'm hearing when you speak. Well, this is like my secret confession that I will reveal on your podcast is that I it's kind of feel like I'm an American historian trained as a China historian. So maybe I'm like making my way over to your field slowly but surely. Like keeping one foot in China studies, but uh, also maybe focusing more geographically within the United States. So yeah, it's, like, impossible, it's impossible to understand what's going on uh, within med- medical history in the U.S. without looking outward. It's very you U.S. Heard in the world. Very U.S. in the world. An H on H exclusive. Um, we, we appreciate you sh- coming to our set for you to make these confessions. It's a, it's a J-Mill <laughs> breaking news. It is a JMZ, it's a JMZ breaking news story. I, you know, I, I, I forgoed my formal gossip bureau for the H on H brand. So this is an H on H breaking story. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between Chinese medicine and everything else that would get packaged under the alternative medicine rubric? Yeah, so TCM often gets lumped in with um, what's referred to as CAM, complementary and alternative medicine, CAM. Um, and on the one hand, you know, it is part of CAM because it doesn't follow the same principles as scientific biomedicine, the type of medicine that you and I are familiar with. We go to the hospital, we go to our own doctors. Um, but on the other hand, it, it differs from other forms of alternative medicine, alternative healing because TCM has its own internal logic. It has its own ideology about what causes illness and what's the best way to treat illness. And this logic is part of a self-contained system. Um, I think it's probably too complicated to do justice to the entirety of TCM right here. But just to give like one key example of you know, one of the ideological principles or philosophical principles behind TCM, you know, a key aspect of TCM is something called qi, um, which you might have heard of. It often gets translated into English as energy or vital energy. There's actually a lot of debate among China scholars about whether or not that's the best uh, translation for qi. Uh, but regardless, uh, qi is something that circulates throughout the body. Um, I believe that if there is blockage of qi, uh, that it can cause uh, illness or it can cause pain. 
And it's where something like acupuncture comes in by needling different parts of the body. This is a way to relieve um, blockages of chi or blockages of, of blood in, in the body, right? So on the one hand, yes, TCM is part of TAM, complementary and alternative medicine. But on the other hand, it differs from things like, you know, hydrotherapy or uh, we'll probably talk about Aaron Piper's uh, vibrational therapy. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> these oh, these absolutely. other sorts of things because it really operates within its own logical world. Cool. Okay. So it's the really tough question now. Who is your favorite Bravo Liberty and what gets them the special status? Oh, gosh. Yeah. I have to say, you know, it changes every season based on what's going on. Um, but I, I don't know if this is going to make me like unique or it's going to like make me really boring, but I have to say this season I am really digging Mauricio. <laughs> and I think it's because he just lets the women kind of do their thing. He always stays out of the drama. Um, there was a, a recent episode of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills where everyone is at dinner at Kyle's house. And all the women start going at it. And the camera pans to Mauricio, who's sitting next to Edwin, Teddy's husband. <laughs> and he basically just signals to Edwin, like, just sit this one out. They'll deal with it themselves. And I thought that that was just really endearing of him, especially when we contrast that with Aaron's behavior, <laughs> you know. Um, so Mauricio just seems kind of like a, a chill guy. And I'm, I'm really into him this season. Yeah, I just feel like the, the more seasons we get into Beverly Hills, the more high Maurizio is all the time. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. I, I feel like, like by the next, high. yeah, by the next season, I just expect him to like always have something to munch on as he's on screen too. Like he just, he is like a I lot think of just, alternative medicine. Yeah. <laughs> well, the question is, <laughs> yeah, the, that's the question. Was did he, did he smoke this much before they started the show, or is this how we get through some of the tapings? These are questions. I honestly, <laughs> my theory is that I think he was always somebody to indulge in. Uh, yes. In the marijuana. Uh, <laughs> but I think that... In the as, 420 lifestyle. Yes, but I think as you watch, um, like if you sync up Beverly Hills to the California timeline of legalization, you see it become more obvious that Maurizio partakes. Right. Remember the storyline? Remember the storyline when someone called Brandy. Maurizio up about... All this it was Brandy and Kyle. Brandy, oh, studio. we're already we're already on Brandy. Again. Where, where <laughs> uh, she was like, "What are you talking about, Kyle? We've been like high in your backyard, essentially, right?" And she's like, "Oh my gosh, no, right?" And it's like pre the legalization in California, right? So I think it. I think we've seen lots of hints that this was always Maurizio's uh, ideal way to spend his day. <laughs> that guy's definitely a party. I mean, yeah. you you can see it when Kyle like gets a few drinks in her. They definitely party. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. But I, I agree with you. I feel like he would be probably the most fun house husband to actually hang out with. Yes, I I completely agree. Easily, I, I agree. even though I'm not easily. Yeah, even though I could do without Kyle, like Mauricio might make it worth <laughs> my while. It just seems like he could be very low maintenance. Yes. Yeah, and he's, like, super successful. I, I admit to Googling him recently to, like, just learn about his real estate business. And he apparently is, like, I'm probably remembering this incorrectly, but I think I remember reading something about how he's the first person in the state of California to sell a house worth over $100 million. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah. I think I Googled the same story. I, I read a similar story. I mean, if I had Beverly Hills money... Maurizio could easily sell me a house. <laughs> I, I like watching Million Dollar Listing because every once in a while he makes his little cameos, right? Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh, yes, this makes it more legitimate, not to mention that he's involved with the production anyway. But, you know, I just feel like they're much more legitimate. The whole show about selling houses, but they're more legitimate when Maurizio pops by, in my mind. <laughs> Sorry, I mean... Yeah. He's, he's a good character. He's a good Bravo Liberty to have. I mean, the interesting thing about Kyle and when she was confronted by, by Brandy, Brandy's always in the center, 
But Kyle had this look like, I cannot believe you're saying this on camera. So she drafted this kind of fictitious persona of, you know, being, you know, pearl clutching. I mean, I think Kyle has this fictitious persona of always clutching her pearls and everything she hears is just so out of bounds. And in some ways, and this is my cliffhanger before we go to the break, in some ways it reminds me of how Denise is handling also the situation with Brandy Glanville. Like there's a constructed uh, persona and Brandy is just ripping all those walls down. So the cliffhanger is after the game, we will come back to this conversation of, in some form. And don't forget Aaron. <laughs> and don't forget Aaron. Do you have anything else to add to that, Emily? Oh, no, I thought, uh, that's a good cliffhanger. So we can just end it there. <laughs> I mean, I love soap operas, so yeah. I could have done better. I could have done better, but, you know. Well, then this brings us to our Bonko Party game break. Woo! <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. So today's game uh, I titled Nip Tuck. <laughs> and... Uh, Emily asked to do a panelist style game where everybody's a winner. So I am, I am going to throw out a couple of examples of um, medical procedures uh, that housewives have undergone. And the panel of Emily, Max, and Jessica will come up with the who it was and what franchise. Sound good? Oh, come on. You can't leave the panelists that way. The panelists of Emily, Jessica, Max, and perhaps, perhaps an individual who might grab the microphone, the debut of Kelly Bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's trying really hard to grab this mic. Uh, at five months old, he's already like, watch out, mom, I'm a star. <laughs> 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 okay, so... Um, and I guess, like, the point of the panel is to beat me, I guess? Okay. It's to come together and be versed in our in our nip-tuck. Yes. Historicizing of people's faces and body parts. Yes. Not making any promises about how well I'll be able to perform on this, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so I wanted to start with what I hoped was an easy one. Who had leech therapy? Phantom the door. No, no, no. I thought it was Heather Dubrow. Yes. I'm going to support you on this one. Yeah. I think it was Heather too. Yeah. Emily? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> is, is Drum roll. Your, is your final answer going to be Heather? Yeah. Okie dokie. Yeah. I'll follow Max. It was actually Heather and Terry Dubrow when they were doing their... Um, how could we when forget... They, Terry. You can't forget Terry. I didn't realize we had to include house husbands, though. Well, that this, seems... well, but she, Terry also is the they star. Did to, they Come did on. it together. They did it together. And really, Terry deserved his own orange. All right, fine. Um, but they were doing... I mean, they, how... <laughs> what were they trying to treat? I don't remember. They were doing, quote, unquote, research for their book that they were writing about various like beauty treatments and so one of that one of them was leeches and so they showed up at this event with leeches like literally all over their no, torsos with like leech mark like it looked like they had a bunch of hickeys yeah, all over yeah, their yeah, body yeah. not leeches yeah, <laughs> literally the, the leech mark <laughs> yeah all over interesting we know terry has a new show completely sidebar Terry has a new show. I just saw the ad the other day, mm -hmm. and I wish I could remember that that catch line because I'm like, it's so Terry Dubrow. It's it's something about Do you like, remember murder? what it's called? Something murder. It's murder and hospitals yeah, it, and oh, now we have to doctors who kill. Oh, is that the show? Yeah, it's some kind of title that like ooh, it's like uh, TMZ meets Terry Dubrow. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm looking it up now. Okay, it says botched. No, no, no. I want the new one. License to kill. There we go. There we go. It's so, it, I, From I'm so excited for it. From bot to license to kill. Okay. 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 Panel. Next nip tuck question. As of August 2020, which housewife has had the most recent facelift? Ooh, I don't know that answer. 
as of August 2020. Of all franchises? Of all franchises, who's had the most recent facelift? And this was a really expensive facelift. How could we even begin to guess? Well, okay, so maybe if I tell you how much money they spent on the facelift, it might help. Uh, this facelift apparently cost $75,000. Um, I mean, my first go is, is it someone in New York? Yeah. It is someone in New York. Oh, then I might that be on to something. I thought it was Ramona. I was going to go with Ramona. Uh, right. Ramona is a good guess. I'll, I'll defer to you guys. But Sonia's face looks pretty good, too. I don't know. I'll go with Ramona. Jessica, you got to go with your hunches. Oh. Sonia and the toaster oven bought a facelift for $75,000. She could afford a facelift? For I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I hesitated. She's always crying poor, so I, I, that's why I hesitated. Well, you know now her clothing line is actually out, and I've looked, and I've tried to order stuff on her line, but it's always sold out. So I don't know if it's limited production or what, but I think she's doing much better now. So it's confirmed that she's had the most work done out of any household housewife franchise. I don't know if it's the most work, but it's the most recent facelift. Because at first I was like, okay, which housewives have had facelifts? But I was like, some of them have had more than one. So I was just like, that's going to be like the entire show, just talking about how many times right. they've had facelifts and who's had what kind of facelift. So I just went with the most recent as of the date of the recording. Wow. Well, you know, Sonya does look good. Because you know Deandra Simmons in Dallas on this last season of Dallas, she had her face lifted right before the season, and she didn't want fans to notice the facelift, and that's why she dyed her hair blonde. And it was such a good move because it was true that I was like, oh, wait, she had her face lifted? Because I was like, so, like, wait, Deandra's blonde now? But that's exactly why she did that combo together. That's brilliant. It was brilliant. That is brilliant. But, yeah, so by the time this episode comes out, there may be another housewife with a facelift. A, another facelift that's more expensive than $75,000. It's probably going to be Ramona because she's mm-hmm. going to throw herself a birthday party, a, a facelift birthday party, and she's not going to remember that Sonia also needs a facelift birthday party because that's how it rolls. Okay, because I do not know where else to put this in the show today. Oh, dear. I have to – I and – Okay, I kind of apologize in advance. I was looking at like, okay, what kind of work has been done in New York City? Um, I pulled up all of these like articles and fan pages about like how many times the Real Housewives of New York have pooped on screen. You know what? Apparently, it's happened again recently. We're like fans. Like, what do you mean? Where apparently there's this like new like fan like thread going on about how when Leah supposedly ruined Ramona's birthday party, Ramona had probably already ruined it herself because apparently Ramona Ramona had like pooped at her party. But then I was like, but then other articles are about like Dorinda pooping on camera and like, and I was like, wait, wait, how many of these New York housewives have had an accident on camera? Like what is happening in New York that they're all having accidents that get picked up in these scenes? I'm embarrassed that I can tell you the history of the first reality show where someone pooped on camera, (laughs) where it became introduced into the lexicon of reality television. I don't know the season. I don't remember the woman's name. But when I say the show, the people who watched it will know exactly what I'm talking about. It was an episode of Flavor of Love with Flavor Flav. <gasps> oh. <laughs> Do you remember? Yes. Vaguely. I see for those it in like who don't sepia remember, tones. I'm not totally for sure. For those who don't remember, vaguely. you see it in sepia tones. It's probably better that way. For those that don't remember, um, a woman had been dismissed as she was walking up the stairs of this fine mansion, and she'd been complaining about stomach pain. And, you know, she went about her business, but Flavor Flav, of all people, I mean, the the hilarity of this, Flavor Flav, of all people, starts smelling something, saying, it smells, it smells like boo-boo, or (laughs) I don't know what he said. But then he went to the stairs, and there was a little, there was a little round pebble, and so the whole story was about, did you shit in my house? <laughs> did you shit on my carpet? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you know, I have these random moments that will pay me nothing in the real world. 
uh, no pun intended. So I just, you know, I mean, you brought up pooping. That's the most classic that I've ever seen. I just couldn't believe that this is what was coming up when I was searching, trying to figure out what my questions would be for this game. And I was like, I got to get current with Roni right now because clearly some stuff is going down. Emily's Emily's looking at her career go down in five, four, three. <laughs> Maybe I should have adopted another topic if this is what people are interested in. Yeah, if you were okay. Scholar, if you were a scholar of waste management, this would be a completely different show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, growth. Okay, growth. <laughs> next nip, n- next nip tuck. Which housewife has hydration and mineral IVs on camera? Wait, oh, hydration. I remember watching this. Oh, who was it? Was it Shannon? Bador? Maybe not. It's though. hydration and mineral. Can you repeat it? It's hydration and mineral IVs? Yeah, so this housewife on camera has had. IV administration of like a hydration mineral. IV, bed. IV. Yeah, okay, yeah. I so can she she IV. schedules an IV to rehydrate and get like mineral therapy. It's not Dore. I could still see her. What doing about that. Rena? No, oh. I don't think it was Rena. No, Rena has her little depends undergarments, so I, <laughs> she's hydrated enough. <laughs> I I thought that I remembered her doing it with her daughters. But maybe something. I I have a recollection of one of the housewives like inviting other housewives to do this with them, but I can't Uh, remember who was it. Was it on Beverly Hills? We officially don't know. Yeah, what shows do you watch, Emily? That'll help us narrow it down. I'm a. This is Beverly Hills. Oh, okay. Beverly Hills. Hills. So Dorit, because she just seems like that. Not like Vanderpump. Blue. Not Vanderpump. No, it's not Vanderpump. It's not Kyle. I mean, like, maybe Erica? No. No, it wouldn't Sutton. be. No. Hello? Sutton. Yeah. No, no, it wasn't this season, though. It I was know. not um, this season. I'm still with the read, but... Really? Dude. Oh, maybe it is Rena. That seems like... I don't know if Dorit would do that, though, on... Because it's so personal and private, and definitely because the Maybe. last few seasons, people have been hating on Dorit. Like it's only been this season that things are starting to turn around for her and Buca de Beppo. So it's because she's become the housewife of the people with Buca de Beppo. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, whose skin looks? That's funny. Who's that's funny. Hold on. <laughs> let me catch. Let me let the joke catch up to my laugh. <laughs> Um, who skin is the most, um, um, emollient? Is that a word? Emollient? And looks hydrated. Who has the best skin on, on Beverly Hills? Erica. But could it have been someone who's no longer on the show, though? The The housewife is currently still filming with Beverly Hills. Still filming. Hmm. She said currently still filming. It's not Denise, is it? I'll tell you who it is not. It's definitely not Denise. (laughs) I don't think it's Denise. I don't think she has the cash. To right. <laughs> it might be Erica Jane. We're stumped. I don't know, Max. Maybe I'll go with Rena. You seem confident. I'm like, me- oh. if the person is still on the show, I'm like medium confidence. Rena. I'm going to go with you all on Rena. Despite his undergarments, I'm going to go with you on Rena. And Max, uh, Max led the panel in the correct direction. It Excellent. Was, I mean, she does have great. And she did take her two girls with her. Mm. And they, yes. they had sh- their their IV hydration and minerals to, like, have more energy. I should get bonus points if we're invoking the Terry Dubrow rule about the leeches. <laughs> I should get bonus points then about her two daughters. It is bonus points for the panel. So we're all, but we're all playing together, Matt. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, we, so the panel is win. now evened out from <laughs> from forgetting Terry Debro because she does have two daughters. Okay. And let's just go back to this while we're on Rena. I was thinking about face and skin. It can be the entire body. I mean, Rena does have the best body. Had yeah, I been thinking it was it for that energy way. boost. 
Uh huh. That would make sense. Yeah. Okay. Which former housewife, as of May 2020, reports being currently unhappy with her lips? With her lips? With her lips. <laughs> this was an interview on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen. Not yes. Bethany. It is a former housewife. Oh. Uh, not Taylor Armstrong. Who was who was Jesus Jug? Uh, 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 Alicia? Alicia? Alexis. 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 Oh, yeah. I could be see Alexis being upset about her lips. That's all I got. Did you just come to her as Jesus Jugs <laughs> first? <laughs> yes. uh, 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 that's so um, funny. Oh, maybe it's Eileen? Because she just did a cameo in Beverly Hills. This is the only reason. I haven't watched Watch What Happens Live in months. But she just did a cameo on Beverly Hills so I could see Andy having her on the show, maybe. But uh, I was so distracted by her brown hair that I wasn't yeah, paying attention I, to her face. Yeah. I, I wasn't a fan of the look. I mean, if you've watched her on soap operas for like 20 or 30 years, that look came from nowhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she said that she's, she did it for a part. She's filming some kind of movie, I think. Right. But if she's not Kristen DeMera or whatever she is on Bold and uh, Beautiful, I don't know who she is. So the, the, the hair, I was, I mean, she's beautiful. I, I actually really like Eileen a lot, but I just wasn't ready for the look. Maybe Eileen. Maybe. As I say it out loud, though, I'm not even convinced myself it's Eileen. I will say, if it helps you, it's not somebody in California. Oh. Oh, well, then that. Um, a former housewife. I'm even going back to the Miami cast. I, I got nothing. It's going to be yeah. such an obvious when I tell you. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm... What do you think, Kelly? Yeah, I, I have no idea. Oh, no, I think Kelly I, knows. <laughs> I don't think it's Bethany because I think she'd be private. She's private about the work that she's had done. Yes. Emily, do you have any guesses? I'm spitting this one out. <laughs> okay. So this former housewife uh, is Kim Zolziak. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Oh. I, that, that was oh. too yeah. obvious. That was well, too obvious. She had so much done, though, that... Yeah. I mean, Max you just focus on one person. person. Yeah, gonna... Max and I saw her in person, and she looked, I thought she looked odd, even from the audience. It's just so overdone. Yeah, she, Very she overdone. felt that her lips had gotten to be, like, too much, and so she's dissolving the fillers. <laughs> her lips? But, but, like, she she needs them to be plumper, so it's like, she, it's like this constant, like, deflating and then inflating to try to find the ideal lip for Kim Solziak. Well, you know, now her and her daughter, who also has her same face, and, you know, I enjoy Don't Be Tardy for the Party, but now they have some ad on, on Facebook that they're uh, selling, like, makeup box subscriptions or kind of like birch box subscriptions, but it's their brand. Um, that has nothing to do with anything other than I wonder if she gets her lips deflated. Is is Ariel going to... What's her daughter's name? Uh, not Bri- Ariel. Brielle. Brielle, is Brielle going to do the same thing? Brielle, the I think, deflated her lips first. Like, oh, yeah. Interesting. And now I think she's also Following like, in the Kylie oh, Jenner model. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. For all the marbles. <laughs> how many plastic surgeon boyfriends slash husbands have appeared on the Real Housewives franchises? Oh, so can you, you give could, us... If you could please, legit... So if you could please name the boyfriend slash house husband and the franchise, that would be great. And I am looking for one, two, this is three, two. four, five names. And it's only housewives. I know I did three not, of them. I did not go to other places. Just three Wait. housewives. I know three of them. So it's Paul Nassif. Nassif? Mm-hmm. Terry what is it? Yeah. Terry uh, isn't Jennifer's husband on New Jersey? Um, oh, is yeah. He one? Yeah, Jennifer's husband. Okay. I forget his name, but that counts, Casey. <laughs> his name is Bill Aiden. Okay, Bill Aiden. Housewives franchise. Um, hold on, let me run through all the different franchises in my head. Is there a house husband or boyfriend on... 
Potomac? There was an additional house boyfriend on Orange County, and there's a house husband. Oh, um, Dr. Brian on Orange County. Yeah. He yeah. did Shannon's facelift recently. Mm-hmm. And, um, and a house husband. And one outstanding house husband. In a oh. franchise, Jessica doesn't watch that much. Oh. Oh, I was going to say Miami or Dallas. He's from Dallas. Mm-hmm. Is it... Um... Oh, God. You know, what's his name? Yeah. <laughs> the white guy. Um... His wife... Uh, went to a friend of the cast this last year rather than full time. Oh, um, Duber. Yeah, Dr. Duber. Yeah. Mark Duber. Oh, now that you say the last, yes, now that you say the last name, yes. Yeah, Mark Duber. Fashion So icon. we have Paul Nassif, mm-hmm. Carrie Dubrow, mm-hmm. Jennifer's husband. Yes. Uh, yeah. Duber. Bill Duber and who was the Orange County person? Brian. Dr. Brian. He, Kelly right, okay. Kelly was kind of like shacking yes. up with him yes. and then she met the Fox News dude, yes. Mona. Right. Kelly's awkward, awkward, awkward relationship. How could I forget watching that on screen? Yes. Um, the only thing more awkward is Ashley and Michael. Ugh. We were just re-watching the last few episodes of Orange County last season and like it didn't even occur to me but she kelly broke up with dr brian over a text yeah uh-huh. they had like a text fight wow uh-huh. that poor guy she just wasn't feeling him there just wasn't any warmth there yeah run it again run it again no, <laughs> there just wasn't okay. any warmth there yeah that yeah does that it's conclude our game, Casey? That, that concludes, concludes our, our Bonko Party game break. Woo! Everyone was a winner. Everyone shoots. Everyone scores. I have to say, collectively, we did pretty well. But Max did we the wellest. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, Max did the wellest. It's <laughs> on age where we're Bravo Demix and we make up words. <laughs> 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 so. Tune in next time for our exciting conclusion with Dr. Emily Baum. As always, you can find us at historiansonhousewives.com, where you can propose your own episode topic, ask us questions, and send us feedback. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at historiansh. We also have new merchandise on Cafe Press, uh, which you can get to from our website on our merch tab. Or you can find us on Zazzle under the shop Bravo Scholars. And don't forget, you can like and review the podcast on your podcast platform. Thank you, Emily Baum. This show is brought to you with the support by Barbara and Mark Spear, Saddleback Community College, Molly Callahan, Dr. Joaquin Galarza, Courtney Crow, Lara Loper, Kim Bettendorf, Luis Asio de Dios, and the Ajipong Foundation. And remember, scholars do bravo too. Oh, thank Kelly for not the mic. It'll, 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 be, it'll be so minor. I was really proud of my little uh, merch improv. I could not have improved <laughs> that even a month ago. Okay. Um, let me just make sure I pressed send. Let me just end our responses.